Hello everyone, my name is uh, Emmanuel Alvarado. I am a professor of Spanish and Hispanic Studies at Palm Beach State College and today I'll have the pleasure of uh, talking to you about hybridity in Latino culture and identity, the heritage and contributions of Jews in Argentina. This is a, a great idea to add to the curriculum um, because it shows that um, the Hispanic population, Latinos, are not a monolithic group, and there is uh, great richness and cultural diversity within the Hispanic world. Okay, so let's begin. When I first show this picture, and I ask people, where do you think this, these pictures take place? Um, oftentimes, students say, say that these pictures are in Israel, and um, these Actually, these pictures were taken, all of them are from uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Buenos Aires is the capital of Argentina. So this is a local Jewish school here to your right. Um, in the middle, you have the kosher McDonald's that's located in the largest mall in Buenos Aires. And to your left, you have a, an invitation to the Hanukkah, uh, Hanukkah celebrations um, as part of a, a community event sponsored by a local temple in Buenos Aires. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the Jewish community in Argentina. It's made up of approximately 300,000 uh, Jews. Argentina is the fifth uh, country with the largest Jewish population outside of Israel. And the Jewish community in Argentina is the largest in the Spanish-speaking world, and roughly 85% of Argentina's Jews reside in the capital, uh, Buenos Aires. And it's important to note that uh, the, uh, here when I mentioned that Argentina is the fifth country with the largest Jewish population outside of Israel, the United States is the first. So that's just a, a good reference point. Okay, let's continue. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the history of um, the Jewish population in Argentina and the various periods of, of migration. Um, the very first waves or, or uh, people from uh, of the Jewish religion to come to Argentina, they came in the context of the Spanish Inquisition in um, or, or around 1492 when uh, the king and queen of Spain expelled the Jews, um, and there was also active persecution against them. Um, so, uh, essentially, many Jews who lived in Spain had to go, had to flee. Some of them fled to Turkey, to Greece, um, and others went to. The New World, and they settled, and they, um, and some of them went obviously to, to Argentina, and they uh, were what we call in Spanish conversos, which means that they nominally converted to uh, Judaism and uh, I'm I'm sorry to Christianity, but they continued to practice some elements of of the Jewish faith or traditions. Um, Sometimes they're called, in, in historic literature, sometimes they're called crypto-Jews. Um, and so these are Jews that were in the New World that were essentially um, either hiding that they were Jewish or they had converted, but they had, um, you know, they, they maintained some element of their Jewishness in their everyday life or in their customs or traditions. Um, to be honest, not much is known about the crypto Jews or the conversos in Argentina. Um, it's it's it, precisely because of the fact that they were um, trying to hide the fact that they were Jewish in an effort to avoid being the subject of or, or victims of the Spanish Inquisition. Um, as we move forward with uh, Argentina's independence from Spain in 1816 that basically abolished the Inquisition in Argentina and a bit after that we begin to see small waves of Jewish immigrants um, 
which began from in the 1850s from the Middle East, from Germany, from France, and Britain. Um, the small there was a small Jewish population that created the first synagogue in, in Argentina in 1862, and it still stands today. And it's called the Congregación Israelita de Buenos Aires, and you see the uh, the, the location pictured here at the top. Um, there is a book I would recommend about the, the crypto Jews or the judíos conversos, um, and it's this book right here, Judíos conversos, la influencia hebrea en los orígenes de las familias tradicionales argentinas, and um, by, by Mario Javier Saban, and it's a book that talks about how these uh, hidden Jews or this crypt, crypto Jews influence several um, traditions in Argentina. Okay, so let's continue. By the late 19th century, there were many Jews that were looking to escape Russia and Eastern Europe. And so by 1889, we believe we start seeing um, a large number of Jews who flee and they go to Argentina, escaping the pogroms, which was, which was targeted violence against Jews in Russia. Um, many of these migrants settled in agricultural cooperatives in rural communities, which typically included a school, a cultural center, and a synagogue. And um, it's important to mention that uh, a lot of these agricultural cooperatives or settlements were financed by a man called Baron Hirsch, um, and you can you can see. Uh, uh, his name here at the top of, of, of that picture at the bottom. Um, so Mr. Hirsch was a wealthy um, German Jew, Jewish philanthropist who sponsored different um, agricultural communities as a way to uh, help the Jews ex escape from, from Russia and Eastern Europe. And th this was one of his um, had settlements um, uh, that you see pictured here, and you see a picture of some of the uh, families that, that were part of that settlement. Um, so the presence of Jews in ranching and agricultural communities gave rise to what's called los gauchos judíos, or the South American Jewish cowboys. So gauchos is another way of saying uh, cowboy, and um, out of this experience, uh, Alberto Gachunov, and, and you see the picture here at, uh, at the top right, wrote a novel called Los Gauchos Judíos, which essentially narrated the story of his parents who fled from Russia and settled into one of these um, agricultural cooperatives, and they essentially became, um, or yeah, they, they had to basically adopt uh, uh, or adapt to the local community and they became gauchos or, or cow cowboys or cow people and um, the story really is about assimilation um, about uh, the, the cultural heritage of the Jews in the rural communities and the novel became quite famous in Argentina to the point that um, it, it Later on, became a film, and it's also a um, a play or a musical, rather that's that's actually presented in, both in Spanish and in Yiddish um, frequently in in Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina. It's frequently presented there. Okay, let's continue. So, uh, Jewish refugees before and during the Holocaust. Uh, so around the 1930s, Argentina began placing very strict controls to European Jewish population. Some of the reasons behind that were um, obviously anti-Semitism. Um, there was the belief that, that the Jewish immigrants would never assimilate, that they were too different. Um, and, and there was also the um, argument that... Uh, they would 
compete with lo for jobs with uh, local, you know, with people who are actually born in Argentina. So, the, so um, essentially, be, because of these reasons, um, there were strict, strict, uh, um, or, or rather, more restrictions came into place in Argentina around the 1930s. Um, in, in, in all fairness, it wasn't just Jewish immigration, it was all kinds of immigration, but um, there was particular emphasis given to uh, the Jewish immigration because they had, uh, the, the, there were previous waves of Jewish immigrants that had already settled in these agricultural cooperatives and so on. And so um, around this time, there was also, a, especially before the Holocaust, uh, there was a large number of Jewish refugees who wanted to enter Argentina from Germany and from other areas under Nazi influence. Um, even in, in spite of these restrictions, there were approximately 40,000 Jewish refugees who arrived in Argentina between 1930 and 1945. Although more than half of them came without documentation and from neighboring countries. Um, some of them would go to Paraguay, others would go to Bolivia, and from there they would come to Argentina. So um, when, I, when I give this presentation, oftentimes people ask me, what was it about Argentina that attracted um, the, the European Jews? And the answer is, is, is simply that um, out of all the, the South American or even Latin American countries, um, Argentina has always been one of the more European-like, both in terms of its population, in, term, in terms of its history, and um, so the European Jews saw Argentina as essentially an extension of Europe, somewhere where they could, um, they felt that they could be comfortable, somewhere where they felt that um, they could do business and prosper. And so essentially, they saw it as an ex extension of Europe, and, um, and and a place where where uh, things would be more or less familiar to them. And so, one, so there were different settlements, um, different agricultural cooperatives that, that continued to absorb a lot of these um, Jews from, from uh, areas that were under the Nazi control, uh, either from Germany itself or from um, Nazi-controlled areas in Europe. One of them was um, a, a cooperative or a settlement in the area of Misiones, which if you see if you see the map, it's in the northeast part of Argentina, close to the border there with Brazil. And um, so I wonder, and on the left here, you'll see a uh, plaque that was, was uh, or a monument that was set up by the local government there to celebrate the fact that many of um, the uh, refugees actually settled in that area and I'll translate what the what the plaque states it states the Jewish community of Misiones which is that that area that city um, as a testimony of the gratitude to the province of Misiones for having uh, granted access to immigrant Jews um, we dedicate this to our ancestors because this meant life for them and the beginning of a future in peace and granted faith in their new country, Argentina. And that plaque was set up um, or was paid for uh, on September of the year 2000. I should also mention another important um, settlement that uh, was set up, and it's called Colonia Adquidor. And a Colonia, a Colonia of Kidor, and it was um, created in 1936 by the Jewish Colonization Association, and it was also sponsored by the same Baron Hirsch that we mentioned before. And this one was specifically set up to, to help Jews who were fleeing Nazis, Nazism in Central Europe, mainly from uh, Germany, Austria, Poland, and Hungary. It, it's important to note that it was the last sponsored settlement for Holocaust Jewish refugees in Argentina, and for that reason, it, it deserves a specific historical uh, importance. And it was like the other agricultural cooperatives; it was um, a rural community. 
and the immigration immigrant population was meant to support the expansion of agriculture. And this is a key point because, as I mentioned before, there were several immigration restrictions, but one of the areas in which um, Jewish immigrants could come to Argentina was if they were um, going to be part of one of these uh, agricultural cooperatives that, in which they were only going to be working um, in, in agricultural activities, and so they wouldn't go into the cities and compete for jobs. Um, so as long as they were uh, sponsored by one of these types of communities, um, they were okay to migrate. And so this is why many of these agricultural cooperatives were so influential in, in granting um, immigration documents to the Jewish refugees during the Holocaust, before and during the Holocaust. Um, so th this Colonia Avjidor reached um, a, a total, a maximum total population of about 1,500 people during World War II and was mostly made up from of, by um, Jews from urban areas in Europe who had no knowledge or very little knowledge about agriculture. So coming to Argentina for many of these families meant learning new skills and, um, and adapting to oftentimes very harsh conditions and very poor conditions that, were, that they were not used to. Um, so in the years after World War II, uh, it's important to note that um, most of these agricultural cooperatives um, after World War II was done uh, began declining. Most of the families wanted to leave the, the agricultural settlements and they wanted to go to cities where they thought they could make uh, more money or have a better, a better chance to, to succeed. So um, it's important to note that that was the, the general trend for all of these settlements all, all of these Jewish settlements um, over time, especially after World War II was over, they began, they began declining um, and, uh, and, and people resettled in the cities. Um, today, this Colonia Afjidor is a historical site which um, hosts sporting events, community events, and also summer camps. And I have two pictures at the top that depict uh, the one on the left is the main um, temple in this uh, settlement, and the picture on the right is a picture of a uh, summer camp that is dedicated to um, sports type of training and education. So it's like a sports summer camp. Okay, the years following the Holocaust. In the years following the Holocaust, uh, approximately 8,000 Holocaust survivors migrated to Argentina. And, however, at the same time as many Holocaust survivors came to, to Argentina after the war, uh, and again, um, it's important to note that after the Holocaust, many Jews were actually not welcomed in their um, in the areas where they had lived before. Sometimes people had taken over their homes and uh, at other times there was just still very palpable um, anti-Semitism. So a lot of Jews were actually forced into relocating after the Holocaust. And some of them fled to the United States, some of them went to France and so on, uh, but some of them went to, to Argentina. And at this point um, they weren't forced to go into these um, agricultural settlements. They were able to just uh, go wherever they could they could um, find somebody to, to, to help them. And uh, okay, so just as they were um, Holocaust survivors who came or, or Jews who came after the war, after World War II, at the same time, Argentina is actually quite famous for, um, having also received many Nazi officers and collaborator and Nazi collaborators who also settled in Argentina following World War II. And in part that was not in part actually, that was largely facilitated by the man that you see here on your right, um, Argentine President Juan Domingo Perón. Um, and uh, 
So when I give this presentation, one of the questions that frequently comes up is why would Argentina uh, welcome Nazi officials after World War II? And it's a complex question, but um, the reason why is, um, well, first of all, there were several uh, cultural sympathies, let's say, in Argentina for fascism. And, um, and in particular, there was a, a, a notable amount of um, German citizens and Italian citizens who lived in Argentina during this period of time. And, um, and in, in particular, the president was quite, Juan Domingo Perón was quite sympathetic to um, fascism. He was actually, he served as the military attaché from, or liaison from um, Argentina in um, Italy uh, for some time. Um, and he was a, a, a man who was very impressed with the militarism of Germany um, with the uh, uh, militarism of Francisco Franco in Spain. So in general, he was, uh, uh, he had um, a lot of uh, both personal connections and, I guess, ideological uh, sympathies for these regimes. So once the war was over, he was in many ways happy to facilitate the um, uh, the arrival of many of these Nazi officers. Um, another reason as to why sometimes uh, some historians argue that that um, Argentina welcomed the Nazi officers or Nazi uh, collaborators was because they thought that um, the that once the war once World War II was over that the next conflict that would begin was. The Cold War, and in in that context of fighting communism, they felt that a lot of these uh, Nazi officers were absolutely opposed to communism, and that that would eventually, over time, help solidify the country's uh, well, so help solidify uh, the country's uh, opposition to communism, um, and they also bet that over time there would be less interest in um, chasing war criminals and more interest in um, solidifying uh, support for capitalism and um, opposition and, and to bolster opposition against communism. And the, the, a third reason as to why uh, Argentina welcomed the Nazis was also um, some people believe that some officials in Argentina uh, were aware that uh, the Nazis had taken the wealth away from many of these um, uh, rich Jewish families in Europe, and that they had actually stolen this this the gold, the the jewelry, the the money, and that they had stashed it away in in, in banks in Switzerland, and that if they came to Argentina, this was this would serve as as Number one, bribes to, to, to the Argentinian officials themselves, and number two, as possible investments so that it, it would benefit the economy. Um, so these these are some of the reasons as to why some historians have um, have mentioned that uh, that Argentina welcomed Nazis after World War II. Oh, and lastly, and, and, and this is also an important reason, some people have argued that. The Allies were also not interested in, in massive um, persecutions of, and prosecutions, I'm sorry, prosecutions of um, Nazi war, war criminals after World War II, especially since um, the Nuremberg trials did not, uh, or there was the uh, failure to convict all the people that were charged, only a fraction of them were convicted, um, and so there was a perception that um, in Argentina that the Allies were not really uh, keen on, on prosecuting a lot of these war criminals and that perhaps um, concerns over the Cold War would supersede any, um, any blowback from accepting um, the, the Nazi uh, 
officers into the country. Okay, some of the notable figures who fled to Argentina uh, include Adolf Eichmann, who was the architect of the um, Holocaust. He was the one who facilitated or who planned and facilitated the transportation of Jews to um, the uh, uh, extermination camps and also into the ghettos. There was also Dr. Joseph Mengele, who was um, responsible for horrible experiments on, on uh, Jews. They also called him Dr. Death. Um, there was Ante uh, Pavlic, who was responsible for murdering a um, large amount of Serbians and, and Jews in what is known as the former Yugoslavia. And there were others as well. Okay, uh, a, a fascinating aspect about the post-war in Argentina was that, as I mentioned, there was a confluence of um, Holocaust survivors and also former Nazi officials living in the country. And this confluence at times resulted in um, uncomfortable, obviously uncomfortable um, types of interactions. But one of the most notable aspects of, the, of this type of interaction was the capture of Adolf Eichmann in Argentina. And let me just provide you with a bit of background about Eichmann. Um, Eichmann fled to Argentina in, in some years after World War II was over. I think it was 1948 that he, that he came into Argentina. He had assumed um, false identity, and uh, he basically carried a passport from the Italian delegation of the Red Cross to the Red Cross. Um, and that, and he assumed the name Ricardo Clement, and um, and was granted entry into Argentina with that passport. So when he assumed this identity as Ricardo Clement, he um, came into Argentina, settled in a suburb of Buenos Aires, and began working at Mercedes Benz in Argentina as a mechanic. And uh, mechanic and technical worker. Um, he uh, And here in the middle of the slide you see the image of his work ID. And um, so he settled there with his family and um, and apparently they, they say that uh, he, he, his, he learned Spanish quite well and was able to integrate uh, into the local population. Um, he worked a number of years for uh, Mercedes-Benz and so what happened was was um, he his oldest son Nicholas Eichmann uh, who is pictured here on the left Nicholas um, instead of using the, the last name that his father had assumed was, was which was Clement he actually would commonly use Eichmann as his last name and he would present himself as Nicholas Eichmann to people. Well, uh, when he was in high school, Nicholas Eichmann began dating Sylvia Herman. Sylvia Herman was the daughter of Lothar Herman, who was um, also a German immigrant in Argentina. However, and Sylvia did not know this at the time, Lothar was a uh, German Jew, Jew who, has, who, who was actually put in one of the camps, in one of the concentration camps, and had survived it. And um, he, he survived, but uh, he was also, because of the physical abuse that he endured, he um, became blind over time. So Lothar fled to Argentina and um, and actually concealed his Jewish background precisely because of fear against anti-Semitism and because of what he had suffered. So Sylvia Herman grew up in Argentina and she grew up as a Catholic girl. 
So for a long time, Sylvia did not know of her Jewish background. However, once um, Sylvia brought Nicholas Eichmann to her home, and uh, and Nicholas introduced himself as, as Nicholas Eichmann, and um, and so Lothar began asking Nicholas a bit more about his father, and. Uh, the more he found out about his father, the, mo the more Lothar began to think that um, Nicholas's father was actually Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann. Um, and Lothar contacted a uh, prosecutor in Germany who was holding a, uh, a trial or who was leading a, 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 the legal process against some of the Nazi officials in Germany. And he contacted him and he told him, I think I, I, I have identified um, the son of Eichmann and, and, and Eichmann himself, Adolf Eichmann himself. This prosecutor in Germany fed this information to the Mossad in Israel and the Mossad sent a team to see if it wasn't, number one, to see if it was indeed him, to confirm that it was indeed him, and two, to set up a plan for his extraction. Um, and so the, a team of Mossad agents followed Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann, every day. They, they identified his, his daily routine, and um, after some time, they captured him, and they held him in, in, in Argentina for, for, some, for some time. I think it was some weeks, and then eventually they, they um, got him out of of Argentina and I think they got him out if I believe that if I remember the story correctly um, they drugged him to the point where he he was um, it would look at, it would appear to as if he were drunk and so he took him they took him to the airport in Buenos Aires and they passed security and if people ask questions if the security officers ask questions they just basically said oh our friend is drunk we're, we're sorry about that and they put him on a plane and took him to Israel. Eichmann had a, a very famous trial in Israel and uh, um, and he was uh, sentenced to death thereafter. Uh, but this whole episode, uh, number one, was embarrassing for Argentina and number two, it shows the, the consequence of this confluence of um, Holocaust survivors living alongside with um, former Nazi officers. I must also uh, uh, state that this story about Eichmann is really largely the exception. For the most part, most former Nazis in Argentina led a very quiet life, not drawing attention to themselves, and, um, and the majority ha were not captured. For example, Dr. Mengele was never captured. Um, and uh, so the majority of them did not um, face any kind of prosecution or anything like that. They, they, they were able to live their lives in, 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 um, in Argentina. Okay, and let, moving on after, so let's now look at the period after World War II um, in, in, in uh, talk about what, what it's like for Jews now in living in modern Argentina. So in the decades after World War II and into the present, um, Jews in Argentina have largely integrated and assimilated into Argentinian society while maintaining cultural and religious traditional traditions and practices. Um, just like in the United States, there are prominent Jews in the fields of law, business, medicine, arts, and culture in Argentina. And just like in the United States, there are various Jewish schools and community centers where Jewish, where the Jews practice their faith and traditions freely. I've meant, I've included a few pictures. Um, this is a uh, uh, what you see here on the top left is a Hebrew school in Buenos Aires. Um, in the top right, is a Jewish family um, celebrating ha Hanukkah. And uh, on the left bottom is a uh, picture of a temple and and also which also serves as a Jewish community center in Buenos Aires 
and on the bottom right you see a march in a um, Hebrew school in Buenos Aires. And uh, oh, I should also mention one of the the issues that that the Jewish population in Argentina faces, much like the one that the the, the Jews in the United States face, is um, a, a clash in between those who are uh, more strict about keeping Jewish tra traditions and those that have that take a more relaxed view. And also there's a strong clash between those who um, intermarry people of other faiths versus those who only want to marry um, uh, people of, of the Jewish of, of the of Jewish heritage and, and faith. So uh, just like in just like this uh, this this these issues are um, a source of tension in among Jews in the United States, the same as the is the case for the Jews in Argentina. And I have some discussion questions here um, that we can talk about. So the first one, how does this how does the information presented about the Jewish population in Argentina relate to your own family experience or the experience of someone close to you? Well, given that we're in Florida and that there are people from all over the world, I think this this would be a, a, an easy question to answer for a lot of people. Uh, for me personally, I, I am uh, originally from Mexico, um, however, I also do have a uh, Jewish background, and so this is a, a something, obviously this topic is, 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 is interesting to me, um, but, um, but so I am also a product of this multicultural um, dynamic that happens in Latin America, and um, so, uh, but I'm sure that students in, in, uh, in your own classrooms can share how their own exper immigration experiences can, or how they can find parallels to the Jewish experience in Argentina. Um, so number two, how has Jewish migration influenced Argentina society, Argentina, Argentina society and culture? Um, by extension, the Spanish-speaking world. Well, in the presentation, I mentioned that the the um, heritage of Jews in Argentina goes back to the Inquisition. Um, there has been several. There have been several waves of, of um, immigrants to Argentina. First, um, uh, they were essentially waves that were seeking to escape the. Uh, pogroms in Russia, and then we had other waves that were of, of Jewish refugees that were seeking to ex uh, escape anti-Semitism in, in Nazi Germany, and then we have um, the integration of of um, Jewish synagogues and community centers in urban centers in Argentina, and we also have, for instance. Uh, the, the famous novel El Gaucho, El Gaucho Judío, the, the, the Jewish cowboy, um, that speaks about the experience of, of uh, Jews from Europe settling in the agricultural settlements um, and the way in which they had to adapt to their new home um, and to the harshness of, of that uh, those conditions. Uh, and the last one, compare and contrast the immigration debate regarding Jewish refugees to Argentina between 1933 and 1945 to that of Jewish refugees that, that attempting to come to the United States today. So that's a really relevant question. And, and um, we can see that uh, there are many parallels in that um, at the time when uh, Jews were trying to flee the Holocaust, and come to Argentina. There was uh, there, there were several reasons as to why uh, people in, in Argentina wanted to, to limit or restrict immigration. They offered arguments such as the Jews will not assimilate, which, as we know, that did not happen. Um, and there were other arguments about economic competition. There were other arguments about how um, the, the Jews would bring 
not just the Jews, but other immigrants would bring in um, disease. And, um, and there was also just a, a sense of um, nativism, as we see in the United States today as well. So all those are, are very good questions to, to discussion questions to, to ask um, regarding the, to ask and discuss regarding the uh, heritage of the Jewish population in Argentina. And I think that's the end of this uh, presentation. I hope you all enjoyed it and learned something from it. Um, and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much.